What's going on guys? Christian back here with Team Elite FTS. I'm in the same chair. I'm in the same room. I think I'm probably wearing the same clothes. And my jet engine heater just kicked off. It is now November. No, it's now December. And we are kicking off the third installment of free programming. So we've went over general physical preparedness, GPP. I let out a very basic introductory concurrent program that can be implemented during an off-season, whatever you want to call it. Typically, I would have someone do a hypertrophy phase, if you will, or being a bodybuilder in between GPP and, um, and a strength block. Okay, So we are going to go over what hypertrophy is in a really basic, basic introduction talk about the ways that you can cause this hypertrophy and then you guys are going to get a two-week free program. So why do we need hypertrophy in the first place? And why is it put into the program typically after GPP and before strength? Very basic and I'm going to try and keep all the information that follows this as basic as possible so that nobody gets lost in fancy terminology or stupid stuff like that because fancy terminology doesn't make you big. We need hypertrophy because a bigger muscle has the potential to make you a stronger athlete as a whole. If I can give you a bigger muscle, I can give that muscle the ability to contract harder, which then is going to move more weight. So that's why we need hypertrophy in the first place. And now we're going to go into forms of hypertrophy and how to acquire those forms of hypertrophy. Hypertrophy and all of the things that go into it get very confusing very quickly. I do not claim to know a lot about the very in-depth workings of the cells and the human anatomy. But I understand it enough to get by and to teach, if you will. These are very basic concepts. I let the doctors and people that have gone further in their education to argue over these points. And then when they come out with their studies and it gets proven overall, then I can take that information and implement it and use it. So I let them do all the fighting. It does me no good. And I take what I can understand and then I can give it in a more basic broken down form that other people will understand. Okay. I know enough of that inner workings to get by. So what is hypertrophy or what types of hypertrophy can happen within a muscle? We're going to look at three types of hypertrophy that can happen in the muscle. The first one is sarcoplasm or sarcoplasmic hypertrophy increase. Okay, This is the increase of sarcoplasmic fluid inside of your muscle cell. Now, typically speaking, when fluid increases, that is a substance that can be greater or less than. So that would not necessarily help in increasing your strength but it would increase in volume. So the size of the cell would be bigger, thus making the muscle look bigger. That is sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. Next, we have myofibril hypertrophy or increase in myofibril. This is where the actin-myosin bonds inside your muscle that allow for contractions to happen. Think of like they crawl up each other and then let go and then slide back, okay? That's how muscle contractions work. Again, very basic understanding. It goes far deeper than that. Myofibril hypertrophy is when these actin and myosin head number increase. So you physically have more bonding points. And because of that, this form of hypertrophy can increase in strength because you physically have more of those binding points, which can help with a harder muscle contraction and a greater muscle contraction. The last one and the most uncommon is hyperplasia hypertrophy. Okay, This is where the actual 
cells of your muscle increase in number, okay? So the sarcoplasmic, the fluid volume increases inside the muscle cell. Malfibril is the actual actin and myosin bonding heads inside the muscle increase. And the hyperplasia is the actual cells of the muscle themselves are increasing in number. Again, that is the most uncommon. So what in the world does that all mean? That was a bunch of big words that meant a lot of stuff of types of hypertrophy. That doesn't help me go into the gym and actually implement that to reach my goal. So how do we cause those types of hypertrophy? Well, there's three ways to acquire hypertrophy. Mechanical tension, protein degradation, okay, or damage, and metabolic stress. We're going to first zero in on mechanical tension. These can get confusing by their definitions, and depending on who you talk to, they're going to give you their views and opinions, and, and it's going to vary. The way I was taught is mechanical tension is an increase in the number of fiber, fibers or the improvement of recruitment or rate coding of the muscle or neurological system, okay? You can implement mechanical tension in your hypertrophy training by rest pause sets, cluster sets, implementing chains, and things like loaded stretches. That doesn't mean these are the only ways to acquire mechanical tension. These are just examples of how to implement them to any exercise that you're already doing, and that will hone in on that means of hypertrophy. Next, protein degradation or damage. Okay, This is the loss of tissue, and then your body finding ways to replace it and then go through that experience of stress again. Now, you can do this by controlled negatives, overloaded eccentrics, and bands. In other words, you're tearing your muscle down at an accelerated rate and then allowing it to recover and then doing it again, okay? You're trying to break the muscle down as much as possible. You can do this in a variety of different ways. It's not just isolated to the examples I just gave you. However, these are some examples that do it more so than other ways like max effort. Max effort movements are going to cause muscle breakdown. That might not be the best thing to do in a hypertrophy state because we are trying to zone in on protein breakdown and eccentrics and controlled negatives and all those other kinds of things do it better. And lastly, metabolic stress or energy system stress, which is my most hated one. I hate when I feel like my chest or my heart's going to pop out of my chest. That's where this comes in. It is an energy demand above the body's ability to meet. Okay, You run out of nutrients, inability, inability to metabolize or get rid of byproducts, and it forces an adaptation. Okay, You adapt by increasing things like capillaries and myofibril density. So how do we go after this stimulus? You're going to be looking at drop sets, supersets, partials, pre-exhaustion, and occlusion sets. All of these are very long sets, and it messes with oxygenation of the blood, getting blood flow to certain areas, and forcing these stressors that affect how your muscles are receiving this type of nutrients or other byproducts. In this program, and I'm probably going to repeat this 10 times, none of these implementations are new, okay? None of them are, hey, this hasn't been found out yet, okay? you will see a lot of things from the influence of Meadows when he came out with pre-exhaustion sets. A lot of my programming for hypertrophy is um, influenced by my wife who has done figure competitions and has worked with people like John Meadows and other well-known bodybuilders that have been doing this for a lot longer. So I have gotten a slew of information and understanding over the past five years from individuals that have done this, 
I've never gotten on stage before, but I have talked to a lot of people that have. I understand how to implement these things, and these are the breakdowns and how you can put things together by yourself and understand them by yourself so that you can start playing around with your own program. And this free program is to give you a visualization of, hey, I can go in here and I can move this around or I can add this, I can take that away, and it's still gonna work. So we've already talked about how we're going to put it into our training, okay? After GPP, before strength. That's how I like to implement it for my clients. That's how I like to implement it for myself in my training structure. When we don't do certain aspects of strength or hypertrophy or cardiovascular things for a certain amount of time, you lose it, right? That's common knowledge in the strength world. So how are we implementing this when we go into our strength phase during our strength phase, not to lose it, okay? In other words, how are we going to make this concurrent so that while we are training strength, we are still training the aspects of hypertrophy and still training the aspects of our cardiovascular ability that we have already grown during our GPP phase. That's where the conjugate system is awesome, okay? You have repetition effort. That's how we're going to keep hypertrophy going through our strength training, repetition effort. Dynamic effort, you're implementing 30 seconds to 45 second breaks and you're just going, going, going to help your cardiovascular ability and you're recovering from stressing your cardiovascular system and your heart rate spiking during that. That's all carrying aspects from earlier blocks through your training so you're not losing it, okay? That's how conjugate is concurrent. You're training multiple aspects of strength on one training day. Why power lifters struggle with hypertrophy? Now, I can answer this one really well because I'm a power lifter, okay? And I don't just claim to be a power lifter and train power lifting style. Like, I'm actually still competing in power lifting. Power lifters, their main goal and all they want to do is lift the most amount of weight at all times. They will do everything possible to lift that amount of weight, whether it is form breakdown, whatever. They struggle through it. If you ask a power lifter with that mindset to go to a machine and move weight, that's exactly what they are going to do. They are going to get into the said machine and try and move as much weight as possible by any means possible. Now, I put out a video about three months ago, four months ago, about how to properly use a laying hamstring curl. When I was at my old facility and my new facility, on a daily basis, I was showing people that they were improperly using it and how to use it properly, okay? Machines are meant for isolation. Power lifters are not taught how to isolate things. You have compound movements that require a lot of synchronization of muscles together to move weight. Once you get into a machine, you need to separate that and isolate one muscle group to grow that muscle group and then you put it back into the system, okay? Another way to look at this is breathing and bracing. That's the big topic right now. You have to be able to breathe and brace, but you also have to be able to separate it. You have to be able to brace and breathe separate from one another, okay? I'm not just making that up, that is a real thing. You can brace and you can breathe separately and you can do them together. Okay? The same concept applies with hypertrophy from a bodybuilding perspective and a powerlifting perspective. The definitions of it are the same of how to get there. You have to be able to isolate on things like machine work. Okay, That's why bodybuilders look the way they do. They are expert bodybuilders, if you get your pro card, at isolating muscle. John Meadows just put out an Instagram post the other day and he had... This blows my mind still. I was going crazy with Julia about this the other day. He, he has a split down his bicep. It literally separated down his bicep. Okay? Go to his page, watch his post. It was literally within the last three days of me posting this video. I've never seen someone's bicep actually have the split in it. It looked like a butt. Like when he flexed it, it looked like a butt. I was laughing so hard. And he said, this doesn't come with being able to train one head over the other. This comes with time. 
okay? He is an expert bodybuilder that can isolate muscle, and it took X amount of time to develop that. If you're a power lifter, good luck with that, okay? You're going to have the mindset of moving weight. You need to remove yourself from that mindset and hone in when you get to repetition effort to get away from just moving weight and using your entire body to move it and isolate one area. And that will take you very far in your development of strength and a lifter as a whole. Bodybuilders can learn from powerlifters as well, okay? You will unlock a different level of ability as an athlete from a powerlifting standpoint or a bodybuilding standpoint if you can take a step back and take a couple of chapters out of each other's books, especially when it comes to hypertrophy and strength training. So now that we got all this ridiculous jargon out of the way, now we want to go in and implement certain hypertro uh, hypertrophy means to our exercises. So you can take the exact same workout you're doing right now and implement cluster sets, chains, loaded stretches, overloaded eccentrics, bands, controlled negatives, pre-exhaustion sets, occlusion sets, supersets, drop sets, partials, to anything that you're doing already if you weren't doing it before and it's going to give you a different stimulus that will give you hypertrophy in some way, shape, or form, okay? If you haven't done any of these before, try them out and you will feel different. Your muscles will feel different because it is a different stimulus on your muscle. That's where that retarded fab word muscle confusion came about. You're not confusing anything, okay? None of this is new information. It's all old information that's been repackaged in a different way. This is the technical breakdown of it. And for a meathead like myself, I see, hey, do something with cluster sets or rest pauses. That makes sense to me. I don't care about any of the other definition stuff. I just want it to work. So that's how you can implement these things. That's how they work. And if you're looking to put a name on it, that's the category that these fall under. You will see in this free program that there will be some implementations of one of these three forms of hypertrophy, okay? I will put in parentheses what that category falls under. Now, there are a lot of great articles on Elite FTS that talk about this in an even more broken down fashion, okay? I could cite a bunch of them right now. I will try and find a few and link them in the post, the blog post above with the program in it. If you have any questions, you can email me at the number 19, C-A-N-T-O, 85 at gmail.com. You can check out the Elite FTS blog and you can check out my YouTube channel. Get a hold of me, ask questions, challenge me on some things. Again, I'm not the smartest person in the world when it comes to this stuff. I, I'm trying to give information that has been taught to me over a very short six, seven years that I've been in this fitness realm doing strength training. So looking forward to hearing from you guys and looking forward to seeing if you enjoyed the program or if you hated it.